What struck me about this film is how little has changed in this country in almost 50 years. We've got police brutality, a lack of healthcare, opiate epidemics, and chaos. It just got out of control. It captures an important part of New York and American history that hasn't really been told before. I got used to seeing the addicts. When we did acupuncture, Breathe out. people got off heroin. Black Panthers and the Young Lords were the first ones to bring acupuncture to the South Bronx. Directed by Mia Donovan, here is Dope is Dead. Breathe in, exhale. Okay, Walter, turn your head that way like you're looking at that hat. Excuse me. I just want to see something. I'm going to adjust this one right here, the liver point. Let me get rid of this. Turn your head that way. No, I know. I'm so bad. There you go, sir. Turn your head the other way. Down. There you go, brother. You get to go, man. Don't try not to tense up when you breathe in. Just try to relax. Breathe in. And exhale. You all right? All right. Mm. Turn your head for me. OK, sir. I've been doing this old yes, for about seven, eight years now. Really? Maybe more. Maybe I'll skip it. Are you ready? Because I was doing drugs like this. And uh, it helps me with a lot of things. It calms my breathing, it calms my heart down, it keeps me relaxed, and it just made me happy. I'm a happy person anyway, and with this, it, it made me extra happy. Come on, put the pins in. Thank you. This, this helps me with my anger management. Because, Lily, let me talk. This helped me with my anger management, and I found out through taking anger management courses, that it's not uh, anger I feel, it's hurt. So it hurts me manage the hurts that uh, I have within and keeps me off of, um, away from alcohol and illegal, you know, substance. Right, you don't have to medicate yourself anymore. This is your natural medicine here. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, hit me up, man. I'm ready yes, to sir. Look up a little bit. There you go. What were you in the military? Quite a few years, you know, quite a few battles. I didn't really know the true history behind it, which was that one of the senior counselors, and I was telling them about acupuncture and stuff, and she came and she said, do you know how this really started? 
and she was like, it was the it was the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. They they actually were the first ones to bring acupuncture to the South Bronx. Growing up in the South Bronx, when the heroin epidemic really hit strong, I got used to seeing the addicts, the men nodding on the corners. And so I grew up with that sense. We just didn't drop out of the sky addicted to heroin. We became addicted to heroin because of the situation and our environment exposed us to heroin. You could buy a bag of heroin for $3. So people got addicted to heroin, and then it, be, it just got out of control. At one point, there were 100,000 addicts in New York. So I wanted to do something. The need to go into the Panther Party came as I watched and observed the interaction of people, the interaction of party, and what the police was doing at the time. Even if the situation required verbal interaction, verbal communication, they rather use the baton and use force. This I seen. I didn't have to read in this in the evening paper as seeing this. So I offered my skills in the martial arts to the Panther Party. Located in the Bronx chapter on Boston Road. In the community, we structured the free lunch program. Also the daycare center. The name of this revolutionary puppet show is called The Child, The Man, The Revolutionary, The Panther. To the United States, we came to learn how to misspell our name, to lose the definition of pride, to have misfortune on our side, to live where rats and roaches roam, to be trained to turn on television sets, to dream about jobs you will never get, to fill out welfare applications, to graduate from school without an education, to be drafted, distorted, and destroyed, to work full time and still be- After work at Lincoln Hospital, I would sell my newspapers, my Black Panther Party newspapers. I sold the newspapers across the street from the hospital because that's the closest place and there were lots of people. There was a, a lot of people walking back and forth. And on the stoop every day was this 15 year old and his buddy who was about 25 maybe and they were stomped down 
heroin addicts. And I kept telling them, you know, you don't want to be addicted to heroin. And let me show you why. Because the system is keeping you, I gave them the whole spiel. System is keeping you down by making sure that you stay addicted and you don't stand up and fight against all the exploitation and, and horrible conditions that we live in because you're over here nodding out. You don't want to fight when you're on heroin. You don't want to. You just stay there and nod yourself hey into now. oblivion. Hey now! Hey now! Hey now! Hey now. Hey now. During that era, I found out I was very political. I don't know how this happened. Obviously, subconsciously, something was working in me. I was admiring the Panthers. I had already met with Bobby Seale and James Foreman, and I told Bobby Seale I wanted to make a counterpart. I wanted to organize the counterpart to the Black Panthers called the Brown Tigers. He said, son, can I tell you something? We're catching hell being called the Black, uh, the Black Panthers. I would suggest that you find another name and work the objective conditions of your country. Try to, try to apply socialism to the objective conditions of your country. Don't try to do what we do. I thought that was a brilliant answer. Another panelist, Mr. Philippe Luciano, a member of the Young Lords, and I've asked him to speak briefly as to the philosophy of his organization and what he feels its place in the community is. Mr. Lucian. Well, first of all, the Young Lords are a predominantly Puerto Rican group operating out of East Harlem. Basically, the way we go about mobilizing our people is through serving their needs. That is, if our people need hot water, then we're gonna get hot water. If it's shoes on their feet, then we're gonna give them shoes, right? And if it's a political campaign that needs, that needs to be run, then we're going to run political campaigns. That's basically what the Young Lords are about. Um, in the process of bringing... And I just fell in love with the, the movement. He, I, once I heard him speak about what we had to do in our community, I wanted to join the movement. Have you seen the skinny little boy that chases the white ghost at night? Have you seen, Have you seen the little boy? Face puffed up, tracks in his arm, and his mind blown. His mom is somewhere drinking and talking about survival. Pops in jail or downtown in the Y. The little boy chases white ghosts with his friend and they get high. And they get high. And they get high. Like cloud nine where everything is fine. The fast rise of people's personal economy grew as a result of selling drugs. Qualitatively, that overshadowed living harmoniously amongst each other, which the Panther Party was introducing. So we had to tackle the drugs now. They are not just as dying. I need to give a note. That's why I need the press to be honest. At first, we went to those who were distributing the drugs and selling drugs. We asked that they stop. They wouldn't. Then we just kindly removed them out of the community. It didn't hit the low middle class or middle class neighborhoods. It was in. It was clearly in in the in the areas of color. If it isn't large enough to to get to the influential community, if it isn't a big media story, if it doesn't affect your kid going to school every day because you're in Forest Hills or you're in Bay Ridge or in some middle class neighborhood, it's not a big problem. I was with, uh, as an administrative assistant to John Lindsay when he was mayor from 1966 to 1973, and basically my responsibility was the street. The blue uniforms that run through the streets like stormtroopers, they are here to protect white law. 
the way I to have is a, a arm camp attitude for black men. As long as that situation is real, we can't have a very good relationship with them. I see another point too. Uh, you're dealing with the pigs and the police. The pigs is the one who bring how on in our community. You see, if it wasn't for the pigs, how on wouldn't be saturated through the black community. What they do uh, when the police make a, a big uh, narcotic raid and he get like uh, a kilo of heroin, he would turn in a pound of it and then he put the other pound that's left back in the community and that's somebody sell it for him and he sell the heroin for the police. Uh, that's why when we confiscated. The hell on last Friday, somebody from the Post and other news media said that uh, we should have took that uh, kilo of heroin and gave it to the police. We would have gave it to the police at 3 o'clock, and 9 o'clock would have been back in Harlem. Pass to the people, brother. Pass on, self-defense uh, not because we we um, uh, we like violence no one likes violence but that you have to like make a differentiation between the the open and direct violence uh, that um, that very often is attributed to revolutionaries and the type of violence that happens every day on a regular basis among poor people uh, whether it's the violence of having to go all winter in an apartment that has no heat or whether it's the violence of having to go to a hospital uh, that doesn't give you service and you end up dying anyway. You don't die with a bullet necessarily, uh, but you die in, in other ways. And that type of violence takes a lot more lives. Today, we don't want to just have rally here. We're going to go marching through the streets of South Bronx. We're going to tell the people of South Bronx that we're not going anywhere, that we're going to be here until this hospital learns and is put back in the hands of the people. That building was condemned 25 years ago. Condemned because it was unsafe for human habitation. Condemned for rich people and opened up for poor people. That's what always happens. Young lords, Black Panthers, workers, and patients who set up a complaint table. So we took complaints to rat bites for babies, lead poisoning, uh, asthma, heroin addiction. They have those 2,000 complaints that we got from the patient work complaint table in their hands and have done nothing about them. A group called the Health Revolutionary Unity Movement, some blacks, some Puerto Ricans, some Jewish Americans, we all got together essentially when we decided it's time to do something. And we decided, I know this is gonna sound crazy, we decided to take over the hospital. It was an occupation that came straight out of the Normandy invasion. Understand, it, it's a U-Haul truck driven by a friend of ours. The gate rolls up, and we were sitting with our legs, our legs open, and there were people, like a guy would sit between us, and we, I mean, it was like a paratroop assault. I knew that we were ready because I was expecting them to look at me for confirmation. Not one person looked at me. They knew exactly what their roles were. We took the built physical plan, it was 11 stories high, we took it in seven and a half minutes. We secured it in 15. That morning, the Puerto Rican flag is flying over Lincoln Hospital. The cops come. They had more cops than I had ever seen in my life. So they send over their best negotiators, a guy named Al, Sid Davidoff and Barry Gaudera. So I get a call one morning that um, the young lords have taken over the hospital, whatever that means, taken over the hospital. The police are ready to move in. Uh, they've got hostages. Uh, can we do something about it? It's one thing to have a demonstration in the street and you cordon it off and you have police and you do what you have to do. This is a hospital where people come 
who are seriously injured or seriously sick, and we couldn't provide, they couldn't provide patient care. And that, it was not, we had to draw the line there. Don't let anybody tell you that there was one minute of disruption of, of the delivery of health care at Lincoln Hospital when the young lords took it over. Never. We uh, had our press conference where we said the hospital had been taken over and we were willing to negotiate, but these were the demands. Pretty much those demands were the thousands of complaints that we had received uh, from the patients in the emergency room at our complaint table. We kept our end of the bargain. Uh, we did open a, t a detox center soon thereafter with, as I remember, a Puerto Rican administrator, uh, I'm pretty sure. And that was the beginning of the Lincoln Detox Unit. We have now started the Lincoln Hospital Drug Detoxification Program. We brought hundreds of uh, drug addicts, heroin addicts, came. The first day that we opened up the doors, there were 200. Walter came in off the street. And I was in nursing school walking up the block with my ex-wife, and I saw this big Puerto Rican flag across the street where the barber was. So when I told him I was in nursing school, he says, why don't you volunteer? In the beginning, I was just like a translator, because all the doctors were white and didn't speak Spanish. And since I had a little experience with nursing school, I went from being a translator to uh, drawing blood. And the clients loved me, because they said I had a, the excellent hands. They even said, you know, I wish I would have known you, or you would have been my shooting partner. This is my, uh, this is one of my cards. Does that have my name on it? We used to be at the entranceway, and we had a big box at the entranceway. When, when the addicts used to come in, we used to say to them, uh, put your weapons here. When you leave, you'll get them back. And of course, this is what they used to do. So they had uh, zip guns. They had uh, knives that were called uh, 007s. Uh, they have uh, 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 ice picks, they had, they carried all this stuff because when they were out there in the street, you never know when you were gonna get mugged or you actually were going to do the mugging, right? Your eyes are brown, your hair's brown, your head is five, six, you said? Yeah. Okay, you haven't had a physical, a blood test, you're not a handicap? All right, now listen, I'm gonna put my name on your car. It's my home number, all right? And if you have any problem where you can't get in there, you call me up, all right? And then once we had doctors from Lincoln Hospital who said that they were going to be responsible, that's when we brought Matulu in. Okay, because we had a medical, you know, a medical director, and we wanted to have a director that had revolutionary consciousness. I was just a sister that came to the clinic, was really messed up. You know, I didn't know anything. I was not politically conscious of anything. I was just troubled. I've learned a lot of things as I've been there in terms of helping your people, making it better for your people. You know, I learned about the, the, the streets and the drugs to that nature, you know, and what it was doing to our people. That's why the political classes, the political education classes, we used to call them PE classes, were so important because we gave them history. We gave them history about what happened in Africa, what happened in China, what happened in Puerto Rico, the political movements that were stopped because of the drugs. We start realizing a lot more of who we was, thinking about our African roots, 
realizing that the names that our parents carried were the names of slave masters that our forefathers had. And that's what we used to call them. What's your, what was your slave name? You know? And most of us that changed our name wanted to get rid of those slave names. And we wanted names that more accurately portrayed who and what we were. You figure, yeah, you've been oppressed all your life, right? So then you wonder where that is coming from, right? But they forget to tell you, right, that the problem really comes from the system. Because who oppresses your mother? Who oppresses your father, right? The system. The system oppresses your father, so therefore they oppress you, you know? And when they start oppressing you, like you hanging out in the streets, right? And the, uh, the, only, the only solution that you have... I don't know if you've ever seen a, um, a drug addict detox, but it is horrible. They have chills, they're sick, they're cold sometimes, they're hot sometimes. It is really, really, it's a horrible life. That's why people don't want to get off of drugs, because it's such a, a horrible experience, you know, the, the, the actual body detoxing. My poem was Jones coming down. You know, day breaks, got the shakes, nose running, joint dripping, mind slipping, body aches. Jones coming down. Coming down. My time is bitch riding a white horse into my main vein. Damn, baby, I got to kill this pain. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. If you are a heroin addict, you need upwards of $100 a day to buy heroin to feed your addiction. And you will literally do anything to get some heroin to relieve the withdrawal. Nixon was under a lot of pressure um, to show real evidence that he was cutting down on black street crime. And you get those people into a program where they are getting methadone every day, they have no withdrawal symptoms and they have no need to go out and steal or hold somebody up at, at gunpoint. So there's a direct correlation. The more people on methadone, the lower the crime rate. It's then possible to get access to the person on a regular basis. The very fact that it's addicting is one of its real attributes. Once a person is on methadone, he has to come back every day. Methadone itself in 1970 is not a new drug. What was novel was its use as a maintenance drug, meaning that someone who used to use heroin several times a day indefinitely could use methadone once a day indefinitely. They would be maintained on it, not detoxified with it. If you're coming from a place that is very critical of federal, state, and local government and how it treats black people, brown people, poor people, Asian people, you understandably might come to regard methadone maintenance with some suspicion because it is regulated and in large part dispensed by the government. And we came here and we went to fight for the United States. If we can fight for them, why can't they fight for us Vietnam veterans? I got hooked in Vietnam, you know, with, with drugs. So then after I came from over there, you know, I couldn't get any jobs over here. So I went to the welfare center and they told me, you have to get into a, a metal program. And if you, if you don't get into a metal program, 
you won't be able to get help. What's what? methadone doing for you? Is it helping you? Getting me high, getting me high, that's all. That's all. What they saw was that was just replacing one addiction with another. And what they wanted to do at Lincoln Detox is have a chemical-free way of detoxing heroin, and also a methadone for that matter. By 72, we started looking around for an alternative. We no longer wanted to use methadone. Dr. Matula Shakur, if it wasn't for his leadership, I don't think we ever would have done what we did. And he was the one who found this article in the newspaper. That an acupuncturist who was treating someone with respiratory problems, who also happened to be addicted to opium, had found that by uh, stimulating the lung point of the ear, did not only help the respiratory problem, but also took away the withdrawal symptoms of opium. So there were six of us there, and we each would read a paragraph. And when we read that article, everybody sort of, the light was turned on, and we said, wait, why don't we do this? When I walked into the program, I was 17 and a half years old, or 18, and I walked into the program and I saw this old man with needles in him. And I said, these people are really crazy in here. They sticking needles in folk and that kind of thing. I need to get up out of here. But I stayed because I wanted to get off of the drugs. So that was the first time I saw acupuncture. I stayed in the treatment program, and as I stayed in the treatment program, I began to politicize myself. I began to educate myself and study, uh, you know, about movement stuff and politics and philosophies, etc. Shortly thereafter that, I began to study acupuncture under Dr. Matulu Shakur. When the uh, uh, patients or victims would come up, we would say, well, listen, we're not going to give you no methadone today, but what we're going to do is massage your feet, we massage your back, and we massage your ears. And what we would use, we're going to use our finger. And so, before we even got needles, we would, people would come up to the Bronx, dope fiends, hardened dope victims. We would massage their ears and massage their hands and their legs, and we would stand there with our fingers in their ears or in the different points, and we'd do deep breathing, and they'd fall right out to sleep and just relax, and then the next day they'd be back for that treatment. And we were detoxifying people off of heroin and cocaine and methadone with acupressure, a lot of love, a lot of commitment to it. And it was some of the most rewarding times of our lives, you know. And it was, it was just great. It was just great. It was spirited. And we then began to get the needles and learn needle insertions and how to deal with a very... All right. I'm in... Move you here. Breathe in, breathe out. All right. Can you touch your head to the left one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Breathe in, out. Thank you. Touch your head slightly. Thank you. Breathe in. Make sure. Breathe in. Breathe in. Breathe out. Please share with them, Malaya, what these five points do. The first point, which is the shivman, right here, opens up your spirit gate. The second point, sympathetic, right here. It has to do with calming your nerves and dilating blood vessels. Third point is kidney up here. It has to do with fear. Your liver, which is right here, that deals with anger. 
And last but not least, right inside the air, that's your lung deals with sadness and grief. So the whole purpose of the collective uh, is to empower individuals so that they're able to take care of their family. You know, and that's the major thing. If I can take care of me, if I can take care of my mama, my daddy, my sister, my brother, and then they can reach out and take care of some other folk and we can do some more stuff, that is the way it's supposed to go. That's what this collective is all about. So on a grassroots level, one at a time, each one teach one. You know, you are your brother and sister's keeper. We started with one point, and we used an electrical stimulator. They tried the acupuncture, and they saw that it did take the edge off. And so they kept on coming every single day. And before you know it, they were so relaxed and sedated that within a week or so, they would detox. So we said, well, we have to stop using the machine. Let's start using more needles. I remember when we did acupuncture and, it, and, and people got off heroin, and to see them moving on, it was like a joy. It was like seeing people being born. And of course, the, uh, the people who pushed methadone were not happy. Everything that we did was based on this slogan of love the people. So you love the people, you love yourself, you love your family, and you don't want to see them living in this horror. So that's why you're working so hard to make all these changes in this society. So we read all the material that was available to us, we read it. The Red People's Army had the, all these techniques that they were using. We just didn't read the Red Book and became political. We read especially the medical books. Before the establishment of the People's Republic, medical services were almost non-existent here, as in most agricultural areas throughout China. Chairman Mao insisted that in health and medical work, the stress should be on the rural areas. The primary motivation for becoming a barefoot doctor must be to serve the people. We wanted to create a medical cadre just like they did in China. I helped the revolution. I helped the revolution because I, 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 because I had, because I knew how. I knew how to do it. Mario Wexu and his father Oscar, who ran the Quebec Acupuncture Institute in Montreal, gave us six scholarships to go to their institute and become acupuncturists. My father, Oscar Wexu, he learned acupuncture in Europe and France. And he brought acupuncture here when we came here originally in 19, at the end of 1951. And, but he wasn't doing acupuncture in the beginning because he was afraid they'd lock him up. They, they think he's a, <laughs> some kind of a cuckoo, lock him in a, in a cuckoo house, in, in an asylum. So who's this crazy guy putting needles in people? In the beginning, he was doing just Chinese massage. And then we used to get all these lumberjacks. So I'm, I'm breaking my, uh, my, my, my thumbs on these guys. Lumberjacks were strong like hell. Each, each uh, uh, massage treatment was like a wrestling match with the devil. And so I told my father at that time, why don't we give him acupuncture instead of breaking your thumbs on these guys? So in the beginning, my father didn't want to. After, as soon as he did one person, Next day, he came with eight people. And a week later, there was 30 people, and uh, within a month, there was people lining up out in the street. It became very popular, the acupuncture. So my father started a school, and uh, we started teaching people. And uh, so me, my father, my sister, my brother-in-law started working, and we were doing 350 people a day. And we had a six-month waiting list. You have to understand the situation in Quebec at that time, before we had the America card. The doctors wouldn't treat anybody poor. The poor were really abused. 
So he, so he started, he wanted to do acupuncture to help the poor people. Now we had the Black Panthers and the people wanting acupuncture. In Montreal, same thing, the people wanted acupuncture. We didn't force it on them. The people wanted it. You're getting much better. I, I like it. I like it. Uh, the kit delivers good. You're good. Are you done? Exhale. Are you done? Exhale. For you let it out. Are you done? Let it out. Let exhale. You know, I'm a drug addict. I've been a drug addict. You know, I'm 31 years old. I've been a drug addict for 15 years. You know, I used to shoot heroin. I got track marks if you want to see. Are you relaxed? I'm very relaxed. Before I came here, I was depressed. Um, I had anxiety, and then because the acupuncture and, um, you know, has helped me to, I'm like happy now, you know, I feel relaxed, I feel calm. Take a breath in, take a breath in, exhale. There you go. Okay, thank you. I was a, a drug user for many, many years. I was in and out of jail. I was um, on the streets uh, with the whole, the whole Shabazz thing that comes with it, with the violence, with the suffering, with the pain. It wasn't until mm -hmm. actually one day walked through 138th Street over there in 3rd Avenue and I was walking and I somehow came across this building that I seen people going in there and I asked what that was. And they told me, well, this is a Lincoln Recovery Center. It's actually a program. And I was like, you know what? I desperately need a program right now in my life. And I walked in there and I was you know, exposed to acupuncture and to, um, that was my first real taste of holistic health. It was actually great that I was receiving acupuncture treatments every day, sometimes twice a day. And then I decided to get off methadone. I was on methadone for 15 years, and um, it was acupuncture uh, and learning about Tai Chi and Qigong and how to do deep breathing and also being surrounded by people who supported me and um, that I was able to change my life. If you go straight down, so you do Shin Men, Kidney is kidney. at the base. See where the both mm -hmm. edges touch pretty much? At the base right there. That's your kidney point. So if you look. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready when you're ready. Huh. My name is Matulu Shakur. Well, I think it's important to realize that uh, the pioneers are always the ones targeted as the fools and the haysayers and all the rest. Matulu was our leader. He was one of the most vocal activists in the community at the time. If it wasn't for Matulu, Maybe we would have never had the acupuncture program. He helped to heal people. He liked healing people. He was good at it. There's no doubt about that. But I think he used it as a, also as a political tool. Which I gave him power and I gave the people also a, a, a power. Maybe I also gave him a following. I don't know. Maybe gave him more of a following. I don't know. Me, I didn't want to hear anything about politics when I was teaching. Not, not politics, was, was love and healing people. That's all that mattered for me, that's all. I never discussed politics with them. I didn't even know nothing. I didn't even know there were Black Panthers for about five years after I stopped teaching them. I didn't know nothing, anything about that. And we got the people who we detox and the community involved in political work. So they all became activists. Run, 
Rocky, run, Rocky, run, 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 run. Because we had all these clients, ex-clients. They were no longer clients. They were ex-clients, part of the movement, protesting the inequality of police brutality, injustice in the courthouse. People jail the rich, free the poor. We're going to try to wake up the people while we are going through. We're going to try to tell the people it is only black and Puerto Ricans in the prison. And the white man today is poor. Because you don't see no mafia song. Because I'm not in prison. So I remember one demonstration that we had in front of I think it was Citibank on 138th Street. There had to be at least 500 people in the street. In the street, we closed the street down. Traffic couldn't move. So we became an issue in the South Bronx and a threat to the establishment. But before they came to attack us, they attacked the Doctors Collective, which was basically a collective of white doctors at Lincoln Hospital who were very active, who were very political, and who actually had been supporting the movement, especially the Young Lords movement, as well as the Black Panther movement, by donating money, by paying rent for some of the offices that we had. They would lend us their cars. So when they attacked, in the New York Times, they attacked the Doctors Collective, and they call them Marxist, Leninist, Communist, those kinds of words, I knew that our days were counting. When you're in the South Bronx, you either get activist, or you get the hell out, or you get hurt. Black, white, Puerto Rican, young and old, all working together, which is what I want to see in our society. Spent a lot of time with Richard Taft. Uh, he was one of the doctors that really did care about the revolutionary ideas that we had and was committed to the detox program. Richard Taft may have looked like he was the leader. Obviously, he, he looked like the leader because he was MD and he was white, and people thought that he was the head. That was their mistake. He wasn't born in the South Bronx or some other ghetto. He came from a family that had connections and stuff. So I always question who killed him. I don't think he killed himself. I don't know how we will ever prove that since so much time has gone by. At that particular time, the administration of the hospital was complaining about the Lincoln detox. They wanted to come in and they really wanted to control uh, our program, which meant that they wanted audits and they wanted people coming in and observing, and, you know, they want to fire people, you know. Because they were threatening us with closing down the program. And so we went to uh, the corporation and the element of surprise has always been on our favor. So we got there super early. We locked out the employees and everybody who came to do business that day. Then we sat down and Matulu negotiated with the Health and Hospital Corporation what we were gonna do with the program. We didn't wanna put anybody in position of leadership because history had already told us that when you put a leader up in front of, to run the, the show, they just bump off the leader. And then the movement falls apart. So we didn't want to put one face up front. And who was the leader? Well, that was their job to figure it out, but we weren't going to tell them who the true leader was. And I would think that they, that gave us a few more years. Mutulu was involved in a lot of different things. He was received by the Chinese government. You know, he was involved in the Republic of New Africa. The big difference with the, uh, with the RNA, the Republic of New Africa and the Black Panther Party was they were talking about land and independence clearly. We were saying, the New, uh, Republic of New Africa, that this land should be allocated to us and reparations, funds to build this land and to build our nation. 
should be given to us. It was always clear that that wasn't going to happen, that this government wasn't going to just stay here. And also, I mean, these guys, these people who were young, arrogant, you know, sometimes cockish, you know, and that rubbed them the wrong way also. And we're supposed to be subservient. We're not supposed to be developing programs. We're not supposed to be discovering new ways to treat something, you know. We're supposed to follow. And that was not acceptable. So from the mentality of the Herbert Hoover type people, you know, I could see how they would want to keep an eye on him. You know, I really, I really understand that. And I understood that at the time. FBI memos made public today show that the late J. Edgar Hoover ordered a nationwide campaign to disrupt the activities of the new left without telling any of his superiors about it. The FBI campaign lasted from 1968 until... The FBI undertook a program in 1968 to harass and destroy new left political organizations whose views the federal police agency disagreed with. The purpose of the program would be to expose and disrupt the new left. In 1977, we, we returned with our acupuncture degrees. So Mutulu decided we'll open up a school and we'll call it the Lincoln Detox Acupuncture School. And we did it. Now, did we have permission? No. Were, were we going to ask for permission? No, because they would have said no anyway. We just did it. I was in the first class of students and we started at Lincoln Hospital. Lincoln Detox and Matulu and other people had built a relationship to Mario Wexu in Montreal. I mean, he came and we had training in, it was a three-year program that we all went through. It was always steeped in the struggle for human rights and the struggle for healthcare for all and in the struggle to really understand the system we were living under and what it was doing to people. China was still doing just tours with, that had to be arranged politically. And of course, they were Maoists, but they, they had no idea what communism was like. That's why eventually they, they wanted me to bring him to, as a guide to China. Because you get money from the government, the grants from the federal government to go, go to China to see the acupuncture. But I told them, Mao Zedong, don't give a damn about you guys. You use you black guys as publicity. You don't give a shit. The CIA follows around China. It was a very bizarre because I actually thought this is 1977. I thought China was, uh, you know, communist and progressive, and the American government. I got it. It was really clear. to come to a person who didn't have the 
So when we came back from China in 78, they were already getting, making plans to get rid of it. Here we go. So we brought this back, the tool and I brought this back and, it's, and the acupuncture chart back here from China, 1978. I remember when, when Koch uh, actually uh, sent the riot police to um, the entranceway of our clinic. We went to go to work and there were padlocks. And so we didn't know what was going on. When they closed the clinic, it was like we, we, we had to fence for ourselves. Corporate doctors at that time saw everything that we were doing as a threat. Because what we were saying is, and the other the thing that's so important is that we were calling a free quality health care for all. That was the bottom line for all of this, that we demanded free quality health care for all. That was the first call for free health care, which is now the everybody's talking about, it's a big deal. But that was the first time in the 1960s and early 70s. And it came from that same group of people. And so when I say there were two detox programs, it was the first one, which was the people's program. And then after that, it changed. It was no longer any politics. It just became the Lincoln Detox Program uh, under Michael Smith, and there was no politics. The, that was the end of the political education. And people went their own way. Matulu created Banner, and he moved into Harlem. To create a new clinic was really the only alternative in order to keep the ideas of the project and program alive and to keep having a space to be able to treat people. But it became, then it was a private enterprise, right? So the funding for it completely changed and access to people who really needed it also changed. And it then became a political project, which was the Black Acupuncture Association of North America. This was where the school and the clinic was housed. This is what I think in the back of Matulu's mind, is that he wanted to create Banner to serve. The whole person, the drug addiction thing, and that was great because that just really opened them up to the idea of acupuncture. But it's more of a holistic thing that all parts, of, we need healing on so many different levels. You know, it was like a real family thing after a while when I came in Banner, because it was like, I was like comfortable with everybody. Everybody knew me, you know, and I just seen a good thing that was going on. And, and I seen that I was starting to feel better, getting stronger about myself, you know, and having better decisions. They were treating everything. And I think what I enabled them to do was to have a little bit of medical oversight um, in terms of is there certain things that they really shouldn't be treating or needed some other kind of intervention, that really didn't happen very much. Then they, they had started the school, which it really populated this entire city with community-based acupuncturists. Two to three of the people started their own schools that still exist, and, and they did all this before there was any New York State recognition that they could do it. It was completely in your face saying, we are doing this, it's for the people, you know, see, what do you have to say about it? And then they began to do the work 
with the state to recognize non-MD acupuncturists. That was the first. And now, of course, they're everywhere. So I was with my Kung Fu brother, and we were selling incense and oils on the street corner in downtown Brooklyn. A woman comes along, and she says, a, a black acupuncture school opened up in Harlem. And she said that. A black acupuncture school. I couldn't believe it. Opening up in September in Harlem. So I followed up. I went up to the school. ago, President Carter came down to this very spot. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? It is three years and nothing has been done. Wait a minute. The plan... Please, wait a minute. Right now in Congress is some... I'm trying to tell you. I am trying to tell you. I can't do a damn thing for you if I don't get elected. No, but Anthony, what are you going to do anyway? We'll make promises. I just finished telling you, and you wouldn't stop talking to listen. I was part of an organization that was called the May 19th Communist Organization. And May 19th Communist Organization came under complete attack in the 1980s, early 1980s and 1981. It wasn't just us. There were people around the country who were involved in supporting revolutionary nationalist black politics. I remember telling Matula this and I didn't know it would be a prophecy. Matula was that person that could be out. We could be out at the after hours room. We could be partying all night. He would come home and maybe get an hour's sleep and get up and take a shower. And he, would, he, he was on the case. Nothing stopped him from taking care of his business. And he did too much. And I used to tell him all the time, I was like, Matula, if you do everything, nobody else is going to know how to do shit. So they didn't do it and they didn't show up and instead you're doing it. So you're doing everything, but what happens if something happens to you? Who's going to do it? And that's exactly what happened. It was like, oh my God, because he had his hands in helping everybody. I think they looked at him on all the levels that he was dealing with, politically, socially, uh, medically, etc. That when they looked at him, they see the problem, this guy here, he's got too much influence in too many areas. He's potentially a leader. We need to get rid of him. I had just gone to bed, cleaned up my room, my space, got my baby together, laid down. About two hours later, I heard this boom. They had blown the door off, the hinges out here, just blown it off with some apparatus. And when I got up to look, I got up and I was on the fourth floor and looked over the railings. All I could see were those black SWAT caps and the lights on the end of their guns pointed at me coming up the stairs, you know, in the dark, because they had cut the lights and everything. It was harrowing. It's a very strange atmosphere in the street. And I was going to work, and I there was, there was nobody on the street. This was in the morning. Normally it would have been a busy day on the street in Harlem. And as I am walking toward the clinic, once again, I look up, and there are... FBI, black ops people on the roofs of all around the clinic in Harlem. 
And as I'm walking, there is literally a tank rolling down the street, coming in the wrong direction. And today, seven people from the radical underground were indicted in the robbery murder of a Brinks truck in which three were shot to death. Subsequent investigations center here on this Harlem townhouse, which back then housed an acupuncture clinic. Tula Shakur, head of the acupuncture clinic and FBI reports say the suspected ringleader in the Nyack robbery. But by the time they came to arrest Shakur, he'd left. One defendant was Cassie Boudin, veteran radical, fugitive. Others came from exotic groups like the Black Liberation Army, the Republic of New Africa. Showing something police had never seen before. White and black criminals working together. Whites renting the cars, blacks doing the jobs. Among those indicted today for murder and robbery in the Brinks holdup, Catherine Bodine, Nathaniel Burns, David Gilbert, Samuel Brown, Judith Clark. I was tortured for about six hours when I was captured. You know, they, I still got burns on my scars from where they burned me, pulled my toenail out, uh, flushed my head in the toilet. That was their way of waterboarding me, sticking my head in the toilet and flushing it. I was involved in supporting the politics of this a whole group of people. And so I, along with many other people, were targeted in this federal RICO conspiracy case. And I was placed on the FBI most wanted list in 1982, at the end of 1982. And because I didn't believe that it would be possible to fight this case, I went underground and was being hunted and looked for with shoot-to-kill orders by the FBI for two and a half years. My husband was, is a physician, was a physician. He was actually working at Lincoln Hospital at the time uh, when the FBI arrested him. And he was brought before a grand jury and they said that he was accused of um, uh, treating one of the people who had been wounded in the aftermath of the Brinks uh, case. And he wouldn't talk, so he, he stayed in jail. He refused to collaborate. So he was in jail for about a year, and then they indicted him as an accessory after the fact of the robbery. And at that point, he went underground. Besides the people charged in the actual crimes, the grand jury has jailed six others, associates and friends of the defendants, jailed them not because they were involved in the robberies, but because they wouldn't furnish hair and handwriting samples. In 82, that's when I got uh, visits from the FBI. They brought me into the, to the courts. So they say, would you like to answer questions? And I says, I don't know anything. I'm, you know, it's just a patient. And that's it. Well, I was told to take the fifth. I took the fifth. They said that, no. Either you tell us what we want to hear or she go to jail. And at that point, I took the position of going to jail. I said, I have to live in the community. I have a child. I have family. I don't know what's going on. And at that time, I, they incarcerated me. My husband was jailed for resisting the grand jury, you know, because he was a friend of Mutulu's. I mean, so, and there must have been surveillance before that. Mutulu and I was on the same case. One of the charges that I was charged with was helping to liberate uh, Sada Shakur and being involved in uh, expropriation of armor um, trucks. And I was given, like I said, 40 years on one and 25 to life on the other. I have won in court after 33 years, if you can count all that a win. We were living in a revolutionary period. So to stick up a bank to feed the people or to build a people's army that had happened all over the world, from the People's Republic of China, Russia, Vietnam. That was part of the movement. That was part of the liberation struggles of the world. 
So we were we weren't creating that situation. We were just imitating that situation. You know, we were part of a world revolution. I didn't know the details. You know what I mean? I knew what had happened after the fact. Uh, it wasn't meant to be a violent overthrow, you know? Uh, the Wells Fargo heist, which, which was done by a Puerto Rican uh, militant group. Not a bullet was shot or a drop of blood. The Brinks was a different story. Ben was arrested in 1984 uh, in New Jersey. It was very ironic in so many ways because after I was convicted of possession of weapons in New Jersey and given a 60-year prison sentence for that, the charges in the, the case itself, which had sent me underground to begin with, was dropped for lack of evidence. And I think that's important because that also speaks to what kind of evidence there was or wasn't against Dr. Shakur. So the first 11 years I was in prison, I was either in small group isolation, solitary confinement, lockdown, or maximum security. Then I, after, after the, the first decade, I did make it into population where I became an organizer once again and became a peer advocate and an AIDS advocate and a prison legal human rights advocate, um, which is really difficult to do in prison, but we managed to do it. One of the men suspected of taking part in the 1981 armored car robbery has been captured in California. Shakur's four and a half year flight ended in this residential neighborhood of West Los Angeles. He was still running, authorities said, when he was literally tackled from behind by two New York police officers who had chased him across the years and miles. They charged me with Six armored truck robberies, the liberation of Asada Shakur, and using illegally gained funds to finance camp for black children in Mississippi and to put a acupuncture clinic in Harlem. A part of the so-called enterprise, I was accused of financing with illegally gained funds. Myself and some other people, we are unindicted co-conspirators, you know, so they said that we were involved in it. You know, they wanted to lock us up and kill us too, you know, and they attempted to do those things, you know. But anytime you have a movement and a struggle that's going on, you know, they're going to highlight specific people, as you say. You heard him say they highlighted him because he started a clinic. Our children who were targeted and harassed, who were followed, who were, you know, put in fearful situations because, like myself, I was clandestine for many years and on the run. And so my daughter and my sons were always followed and, and, and you know, they would go into their schools. And so they knew the reality of what this is. Uh, Tupac wasn't more angry just to be angry. I think his mother's life as a, as a member of the Panther 21 and the Panther situation, his growing up in Lincoln Hospital with us, you know, and that whole struggle with the Republic. He grew up around dope fiends all his life, you know. He grew up in, in, in you know, in the, in the tension of what we were going through with these various counterintelligence operations. In a better world, 
we could have done better with that anger and a better world and a better circumstances. But I think he did the best that he could. Okay, we're gonna do the same exact thing on the other side. I wanna make it so they don't come out. Turn your head for me. Pa liver. Y pa lungs. It stimulates the point when I put this into your ear. I'm sending a message to your brain because every yeah. part of your ear represents no, the inside of you. So when we're stressed out and we're worried, we get very tight, the muscles get very tight, it's difficult to breathe, you get angry, you get upset very easily, yeah. this will relax you. And you'll see in 10 minutes that you're gonna feel like, wow, was there medicine in here? No, the medicine's already in your body. Right. This is just releasing it into your organs, increasing the blood flow to your brain. We see progress in people's lives where before I would see the pain that people go through, through drug use, I would see the suffering, but I felt at that time there was nothing I could do. I would just either witness the pain and act like it didn't happen and just keep, keep moving and keep getting high myself because I had my own pain. And today, regardless of my own pain, I tried my best to make sure that I ease the pain that others have. And today I see that. I see that when people walk through these doors and they're in pain, and they go. <laughs> you gotta cut that. <laughs> when I see people in pain and they come out of here feeling better, then I know I did my job. I know that I did something today that made a difference in somebody's life. And that's the most important thing to me. So today, coming in remotely from Montreal, Canada, is the writer, editor, and director of Dope is Death, Mia Donovan. Hey, Mia. Hey, thanks for having me. So this is an important question, I think, that we've talked about internally here. America's response to drug addiction has changed a lot. What role do you think race has played in this? If we look at what the Lincoln Detox Collective was teaching in their political education classes, and also from what I learned talking to Dr. Peter Bourne, it's clear that the drug policies are directly related to race. Also, with the Black Panther Party um, and the ideology of the Lincoln Detox political education classes, drugs usually serve, I would say, or always serve the dominant class in society. If it isn't large enough to, to get to the influential community, if it isn't a big media story, if it doesn't affect your kid going to school every day because you're in Forest Hills or you're in Bay Ridge, you're in some middle class neighborhood, it's not a big problem. How do you contrast it with what's happening today? What you describe about Nixon and his policies was not a policy to save lives, it was to incriminate and incarcerate. Yeah. In today's opiate epidemic, 
The response is very different. It's about saving lives now, so they say. To put it bluntly, is it because the addiction is affecting suburban white people now, whereas back in the day, it was inner city black people and brown people? I mean, I would say that absolutely, that that's why. You know, as soon as the opioid crisis really penetrated the suburbs and the white community, suddenly we look at it as a public health issue. And also even a recognition that the drug users, it's not their fault that they got addicted to opioids. It affects more white people and more people in the, in the suburbs. And when I talk to some of these freedom fighters or these activists today, that these former Black Panthers, they keep telling me that nothing has ever changed. When I first interviewed Seiko Odinga, I asked him if things were better. I think I might have even said, how are things better today than they were when you joined the Black Panther Party in the late 60s? And he kind of laughed and said, they're not better at all. Don't be. In watching the film, it made me think that so little has actually changed in our society here. And, you know, how do you think this story is relevant to what is happening in the Black Lives Matter movement today? The Black Lives Matter movement is a direct continuation of what was happening over 50 years ago with the Black Panther Party, the Republic of New Africa, and the Young Lords, and these political activists who were actively resisting police oppression. Even if the situation required a verbal interaction, verbal communication, they rather use the baton and use force. This I think, I didn't have to read in, this, in the evening paper as seeing this. The only thing that they say really has changed is that there's cameras today so we can see police brutality happening and we can really look at it and um, confronted as a society. Okay, so as a white Canadian filmmaker, yeah. how did making this film change your perspective on this country? I think for me, while making this film, it really put into clear, crisp focus just how white supremacist America is, and Canada even, and just like the fact that everything is political, healthcare, access to education, drug policy, all these aspects that are touched upon in the film. For me, I, I knew, I understood, you know, my position as being a white person before making this film, but since making this film, I really understand the privilege that just having white skin, what that privilege is politically and in terms of just navigating a society. I'm ready when you're ready. Huh. My name is Matulu Shakur. Well, I think it's important to realize that uh, the pioneers are always the ones targeted. What was it like for you to visit Matulu Shakur in a maximum security federal penitentiary? The first time I, I went to visit Matulu, it was quite an intense experience. I, I mean, I had seen a lot of TV shows about prisons in America, but to actually go there and to visit and to go through the whole process of visiting somebody who's incarcerated in a maximum prison is extremely sobering. They charged me with six army truck robberies. First of all, I, I, I was the only white person there aside from the guards, so it really made me look at just how disproportionately people of color are being incarcerated in America. So that was itself very heavy to, to witness. It's important to understand the kind of the experience of visiting people in prison and week after week, waiting for hours, going through the whole process of, um, you know, being interrogated and like scanned just to visit a family member is psychologically, it's very draining and the long-term effects of all these families who are broken up because of the prison system and the kind of psychological warfare that prisons use to keep families divided and to make it as uncomfortable as possible to visit people. It just feels so inhumane. Did you ever question the perspective of the media given the 
lack of diversity in journalism at the time. And that most of what was being documented or written about was by outsiders. When I first heard about this history, there wasn't a lot of information available. There was the, the, the newspaper articles, which were in many cases clearly biased, you know, with quotes about how J. Edgar Hoover saw the Black Panthers as, as criminals, and also even articles in the New York Times about the Lincoln Detox, with the Lincoln Detox was indoctrinating former drug users into radicals. There was also this tendency of some accounts, some like documentaries and books that had written about the Lincoln Detox and later Banna, which was Matulu's clinic in Harlem, as almost being fronts to like domestic terrorist organizations and completely dismissing the medical side of what they were doing. When I began, it was like, I need to interview as many people as I can who were there and get their first person perspective and accounts of this history. 90% of the mainstream news media of that era was really represented this clinic with some suspicion. There were also others who really celebrated what was happening, but for, you know, by the end of the 70s when the clinic was shut down, it's like the city was able to sort of discredit them by associating them to criminal activities. Is Dr. Matula Shakur still trying to teach from inside of prison? Yeah, he's been doing empathy courses with people. Uh, he was in California for a long time, so there was a lot of members, uh, people incarcerated who were in opposing gangs, and he works a lot to bring people together, and he's mentors people, he mentors young men. I think he does acupuncture pressure points, like without needles. He inspires so much hope in people. It's hard to explain, like it sounds almost like I'm describing a cult leader or something, but people told me when they described Matulu, they all said how he just has this power to really inspire people and make people feel like empowered. There's a book about my mother called Look For Me In The Whirlwind. And I like to think that's my, my, my motto, Look For Me In The Whirlwind. Does world. being and Tupac's stepfather add to his kind of legend inside a prison? I think on my third visit to visit him, he was like, you're the only person who doesn't ask me about Tupac Shakur. Um, but later, then I, I did start asking him later, but. So, um, so can you give us the goss? Like what, what, is, what was the exact relationship between Dr. Shakur and Tupac? And So Matulu was married to Afeni Shakur, Tupac's mother, and continued to mentor Tupac later, he wrote the Thug Manifesto with Tupac Shakur. And also Moprim Shakur, which is Matulu's biological son. Matulu used to bring Tupac to the Lincoln Detox and patients remember him. He would run around and he would bring people juice and like he would just like, him and Mo would hang out there. So they grew up around drug users. Tupac grew up around these around this community, so it made him very sensitive and politically smart. And the next day they'd be back for that treatment. And we were detoxifying people off of heroin and cocaine and methadone with acupressure, a lot of love, a lot of commitment to it. And it was some of the most rewarding times of our lives, you know. And it was it was just great. It was just great and spirited. I thought your use of archival really made the movie in a way because it, it just transported me. And it's so powerful, whether it's the Black Panthers or the Young Lords or just the footage of, you know, heroin addicts shooting up on the street is it's very, very graphic. We just didn't drop out of the sky addicted to heroin. We became addicted to heroin because of the situation and our environment exposed us to heroin. You could buy a bag of heroin for $3. At one point, there were 100,000 addicts in New York. So I wanted to do something. That clip is kind of at the beginning of the film, and it's just like, it was like a punch in the face. In order to tell this story, I really wanted to bring the viewers back to like the New York, South Bronx in the 1970s to, and to 
really try and illustrate the socio-political economic conditions that gave birth to the activism that was going on with the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. To understand the movement, you have to understand the context. And there's just this idea that these were all really young people, really young activists in their late teens, early 20s, and living in these conditions that were just so extreme. The South Bronx was a very difficult environment to grow up in. There was 60,000 empty apartments, empty homes in the South Bronx. There was fires every day. Um, there was a lack of basic services. Subway lines weren't running. It was a very, very bleak place. The footage I was attracted to most, with uh, particularly with the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, was the footage of them working in the community. Located in the Bronx chapter on Boston Road. With the breakfast program for children and when they're like giving out food to the community. The Western media at the time really portrayed them as these militant, uh, almost dangerous people. The majority of their activity was just providing for basic needs to their community. Like they called them survival programs. So it was providing health care, providing food, uh, medical treatment, um, support. So it was very important to like be able to represent that. There's that great scene with Felipe Luciano at a almost like a press conference, and he's kind of breaking down what the young lords do. We are here to serve the community. And I think there's this kind of idea like of militancy when you talk about these groups from back in the day. First of all, the young lords are a predominantly Puerto Rican group operating out of East Harlem. Basically, the way we go about mobilizing our people is through serving their needs. That is, if our people need hot water, then we're gonna get hot water. If it's shoes on their feet, then we're gonna give them shoes, right? And if it's when you dive deeper into this history and what the government was doing, what the FBI and the counterintelligence program was doing, there was a, a strategic effort to mislabel these organizations as, as criminal. For instance, J. Edgar Hoover felt that the breakfast programs were a threat to the political stability of America. You hit the nail on the head because when I watched this, I was like, how did I not know about this before? That the Black Panthers brought basically acupuncture to deal with addiction. And you also trace the roots of that back to China. And those clips are also great. Knowing a lot of people who've dealt with heroin addiction and methadone or now suboxone and like how come nobody's ever talked about like doing acupuncture as a way to kick dope before that was one of the things that also interested me about this history because i have a stepbrother who's been on and off of methadone for 30 years now and when we were kids when we were teenagers i went to some of the 12-step programs with him like for family week so I was always very suspicious and aware of the failures of standard drug program, treatment programs, like methadone particularly. So when I heard that there was these activists, these Black Panthers and Young Lords who were using acupuncture to treat heroin withdrawal symptoms and political education to sort of heal psychological roots of addiction, it just was so fascinating to me. And this idea of a non-chemical way to treat withdrawal symptoms and dope sickness. Nixon was under a lot of pressure um, to show real evidence that he was cutting down on black street crime. And you get those people into a program where they are getting methadone every day, they have no withdrawal symptoms and they have no need to go out and steal or hold somebody up at, at gunpoint. So, there's a direct correlation. The more people on methadone, the lower the crime rate. Methadone itself in 1970 is not a new drug. What was novel was its use as a maintenance drug, meaning that someone who used to use heroin several times a day indefinitely could use methadone once a day indefinitely. They would be maintained on it, not detoxified with it. From the perspective of the Panthers and wanting to bring acupuncture in, it was to deal with both heroin addiction and methadone. 
Is that right? Yeah, they were responding to both the lack of drug treatment programs available to the people of the South Bronx and the methadone maintenance programs that were starting to pop up everywhere in the South Bronx and Manhattan, all across New York at this time. And they recognized that people were still getting high. They, they recognized the, the control factor in methadone. There was issues like people who were receiving welfare benefits couldn't get their checks if they weren't getting their methadone every day. The way it was dispensed was connected to crime, you know, like you would, you were given the option of jail time or going on methadone in some cases. So right away, they saw it as liquid handcuffs. This Walter Bosque says that, like, it's basically another way of controlling people and taking away their liberties. We no longer wanted to use methadone. Dr. Matula Shakur, if it wasn't for his leadership, I don't think we ever would have done what we did. And he was the one who found this article in the newspaper. So Matula Shakur is a kind of central character to your film and also played a, a big role in the kind of events that transpire. How important was it for you to get his and his family's blessing on this film. As soon as I heard about this story through my acupuncturist in Montreal, through Mario Wexu, I started to correspond with Matulu, who back then was incarcerated in California. So we started writing, I started corresponding with him, and then I started to visit him. And I didn't even consider pursuing this project without his support. You know, he, he's, in, he's incarcerated. He couldn't view any of my former, any of my other films or really do any research on me. So his son, Moprim Shakur, was his like source on the outside, like his eyes and ears and sort of sussed out my work. And I spent a lot of time with Moprim Shakur and his wife, Talia Rodriguez Shakur, who were really important in, in terms of the process of this documentary and helping me with access to people and, you know, as consultants and with all my documentaries, I, I need to have 100% um, support between myself and the subjects I'm working with, and there needs to be a collaboration. There's a lot of other Shakurs that are, are involved in the film, so that was very important. It seems like you had to put a lot of legwork into establishing relationships. What was your motivation for that? Was it your interest in acupuncture or the, the Black Liberation Movement or addiction or systemic racism or all of the above? Well, it was all of the above. I mean, it's a story that encompasses so much. And I think just the overall injustice of the whole situation with Dr. Shakur incarcerated and uh, the fact that this collective of young activists did not get the credit, are not in the acupuncture history books for developing this amazing protocol was just so surprising to me. And then Matulu wasn't released in 2016 and I had already developed this relationship with him and this fascination with this history that I just couldn't let go of. So I started to look at a different way to tell Matulu's story because I, I was so, at that point, frustrated that he wasn't released and that he was still viewed primarily as a criminal and not a community healer. Most vocal activist in the community at the time, if it wasn't for Matulu, maybe we would have never had the acupuncture program. He helped to heal people. He liked healing people. He was good at it. There's no doubt about that. But I think he used it as a, also as a political tool. Which I gave him power and I gave the people also a, a, a power. Maybe I also gave him a following, I don't know. Maybe gave him more of a following, I don't know. There was an urgency to provide this counter narrative so people could understand what a great uh, you know, what a great community activist he is and how valuable he is to the community and, and, and the good work that he did. There was a real need to provide this accurate history of, you know, the other side, um, the real narrative. You wanted to set the record straight on some level. Yeah. 
And I think, you know, once you start to get involved with people and you learn about their history, I, I, I just like, I become very emotionally invested and I, I was just really committed to, to trying to, to do this. This is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to do this show and to find films like Dope is Death and directors like yourselves who are doing the films and the projects that we could never do here for whatever reason. It's just like the nature of our business is different. And and so I'm just really inspired by how your, your like commitment to this project. It does seem like sometimes when I think back that how many years it's been, it seems a little um, excessive, but at the same time, my two prior documentaries as well took a long time. So I think I have that patience and it's really important for me to, to not only to research the history through texts, but to really understand people's motivation and where they're coming from and like understand the cultural context. So I get really, I do kind of really get Im immersive and it's not the most sustainable process for, for making documentaries, but. But um, you have a process yeah. and the results speak yeah. for themselves. So I had a, at first envisioned a film that would be Matulu and Mario Wexu reuniting and continuing their work as acupuncture. So it was, a, it was a much different story in the beginning. It was much more about this reunion between Dr. Matulu Shakur and his former teacher who had then become a drug user himself who was getting clean at that time in 2012. And the first time I got a treatment from him, it was like the real thing, he's incredible. And there was this poster on the wall that was very colorful and it had like these illustrations of skulls and these like black hands holding acupuncture needles and these like armed militants. And it said, we will fight heroin and methadone by any means necessary, educate the people, acupuncture heals. It was just this incredible poster for the Lincoln Detox from 1973. So I started asking Mario questions about this poster. And that was like our entry point into this history because he just like everything was in this poster and he just sort of broke it down. Uh, Matulu Shakur and three others who were Black Panthers, the Young Lords in the Republic of New Africa, they all came to Montreal to do their residency in a small clinic in the east end of Montreal, which was mostly working class Quebecois people. So this was just so fascinating <laughs> to me. A group called the Health Revolutionary Unity Movement, some Blacks, some Puerto Ricans, some Jewish Americans, we all got together essentially when we decided it's time to do something. And we decided, I know this is gonna sound crazy, we decided to take over the hospital. It was an occupation that came straight out of the Normandy invasion. Another crazy piece of New York City history that I did not know. There was a series of other actions that they had taken. They had actually hijacked a x-ray truck that was going around Manhattan and it wouldn't go north of 110th Street. I love that you included the last poets in the film. My poem was Jones coming down. You know, day breaks, got the shakes, nose running, joint dripping mind, slipping body aches. Jones coming down. Can you tell me a little bit about that and why you decided to depict it like that? Jalal from The Last Poets was actually um, part of BANA, which was the acupuncture clinic that Dr. Matula Shakur opened in 1980 in Harlem. Jalal was a student of his, of his and also a student of Mario's. So Mario told me about Jalal. As I mentioned earlier with the archives, I was really interested in creating a landscape, like a social political landscape and context of the movement and uh, the clinic. And the last poets, that, those first two albums speak a lot about the drug plague, the heroin epidemic that was happening. To me, it was just a way of representing this other side of the creativity and the art and the hope that came out of this landscape, you know, this this hopelessness of, of the South Bronx. You know, the Last Poets are, are a group that we included in the pages of the magazine back in the mid 90s as like, these guys were so cool and they're still around releasing projects. I've never seen interviews or heard their music in the context of what was ha actually happening 
and with the visual kind of archival of what they were talking about in their songs. And to me, that really transported me the same way the archival did. And this just took me even further and connected the dots to like the cultural side and what was being created as a result of this kind of insane environment in the South Bronx at the time. So I thought that was just incredibly well crafted. Pawn my brother's do rag to cop me a transparent thin bag. You see, you see, cause I'm, I'm strung out, strung out. I'm white witch, my time is pitch riding a white horse into my main vein. Damn, baby, I got to kill this man. So is it safe to say that you made this film because you had migraines? Yeah. <laughs> not, and not, not, to, not to be flippant, but the inception of this film was because you had migraines and so you sought out the best acupuncturist in Montreal and then you were like, holy shit, the story's amazing. The primary motivation for becoming a barefoot doctor must be to serve the people. We wanted to create a medical cadre just like they did in China. I helped the revolution. I helped the revolution because I, I, I because I had because I knew how. I knew how to do it. I love Mario Wexu. I think he's just like he reminds me of like people I knew from back in the day when I lived in Quebec. He had so many like great lines in the film. Like I didn't even know they were Black Panthers. I was like, you know, <laughs> like the, they gave scholarships to the Black Panthers to come, or his father did to come to Montreal. There's just so much about that as a Montrealer. You have to understand the situation in Quebec at that time, before we had the America card. The doctor wouldn't treat anybody poor. When I watched it, I didn't know that you were a Montreal-based filmmaker. I assumed it was someone in the States or someone in New York had made this film that was closer to the story, let's say. I just love the connection between Montreal and New York in this story. I've always felt that these two cities have a, a connection. I'm not sure so much these days right now. What also attracted me to this, this story was the role that Montreal plays in the history of acupuncture. Like we had the first acupuncture school in North America outside of Chinese communities. Mario's father brought acupuncture to Montreal in the 50s. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a whole other story there. In the beginning, he was doing just Chinese massage. And then we used to get all these lumberjacks. So I'm, I'm breaking my, uh, my, my, my thumbs. And these guys, lumberjacks were strong like hell. Each, each uh, massage treatment was like a wrestling match with the devil. And so I told my father at that time, why don't we give him acupuncture instead of breaking your thumbs on these guys? So in the beginning, my father didn't want to. After, as soon as he did one person, next day he came with eight people. And a week later, there was 30 people, and uh, within a month, there was people lining up out in the street. It became very popular, the acupuncture. So my father started a school, and uh, we started teaching people. And uh, so me, my father, my sister, my brother-in-law started working, and we were doing 350 people a day. And like, we had a six-month waiting list. You said before, it's not sustainable the way you, your process for making these films, but it seems like you're doing something right. Yeah, when I say sustainable, I mean, it's hard to make a career being a documentary filmmaker if you're taking- 10 years for six, film? Six, seven years to make six, a seven, film. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's worth it. It's like, I can't really imagine how I would have made this documentary in a year and a half just to, to get the trust of people, to really, you know, the back and forth of um, looking for archives and verifying sources and, you know. Well, yeah. I want to thank you again for, for giving us so much of your time and for making this very important film. <laughs>